Welcome everyone to Daf Yomi one week at a time. Uh, uh, this is our ninth lesson, and today we are going to be reviewing Daf 60 to 66. Uh, and I'd like to dedicate our learning tonight um, to all the soldiers uh, that are fighting. They should come home safely uh, and in memory of the people uh, that we have lost uh, in the past week and a half. Um, may their memory uh, be, you know, remembered and uh, memorialized, and uh, may we just have peace very quickly. Um, okay, uh, we are going to talk about uh, today. We're going to continue talking about um, betrothals that come with conditions. Um, so we left off yesterday, uh, last week with this idea of a person says, uh, I want to betroth you now and in 30 days from now, uh, which basically means, uh, in 30 days or, well, we're not sure exactly what it means, but seems to mean in 30 days. And then another person comes to her, like say the next day and says, I want to betroth you now. And in 20 days, and then another comes and says now in 10 days. So she only needs to get a get from the 1st 1 and from the last 1. Um, because either the 1st is valid or the last is valid. Uh, and therefore we have to make sure. That we get uh, a get from a divorce from both of them, or you need a get from all of them or. Each one takes effect over time, right? In 10 days and then in 20 days and then 30 days, um, right? Because each one left space for the next one. Um, we learned this in Gitten. If you remember, someone said, here's your get um, from now and when I die. So then if he dies, she needs, we're not sure if it's now and therefore it's valid or when I die, and therefore it's not valid. Uh, and therefore she has to do chalitza if there is a brother who is surviving the, who survived the husband. Um, or maybe she can do yibum. Again, maybe uh, it doesn't work at all, or it's really a complete divorce. So as you can see, we have all three opinions as to how we see this case. Um, okay. Um, the, the next Mishnah on Daf 60 tells us, excuse me, um, okay, that, um, a man says to a woman, you are betrothed to me on condition that I give you 200 zoots. So the Mishnah tells us this is valid and he needs to give her the 200 zoots. Let's say he says, if I give it to you within 30 days, then if he gives it to her within 30 days, she is betrothed. So now the Gemara explains the condition. Again, we have to understand how the condition works. When he does the condition, then retroactively she is betrothed or no, right? Only when she gets it, she becomes betrothed, but not beforehand. Why is this important? Because if a second person comes and betroths her in the middle, uh, so again, if it works retroactively, so she's already betrothed to the first person, if it only works for when he gives her the money, so then the second person can come and betroth her before he gives her the money, and then it would be valid. The Gemara explains this is the same thing with a get, with divorce, right? When she, let's say he says, Right when you give me 200 zoos, right? So then when she gives the money, the get works retroactively, they're divorced. Or when she gives the money, that's when she gets divorced. Why is this important in this case? Because for divorce, let's say the get gets lost and she hasn't given the money yet. So then it doesn't matter if it works retroactively, because as soon as she gives the money, it's as if she got the get originally, and then it would be valid. Um, okay, 
let's say he says right here is a get when you give me money if she gives the money and then he dies so now she doesn't need to do yibum because again the when she gave the money she retroactively became divorced even though now he died right and if she um didn't give the money so then she has to do yibum um right so again we understand when it says on condition which in hebrew means al minat uh right if someone says i'll do this on condition that you do the the following thing so on condition means as if it means from now, right? And therefore it works retroactively in order to divorce her or to betroth her. Um, again, as we said, if you say today and after I die, it's a machloket if it's a valid get. Because again, remember, you cannot give a get if the person dies. So that's why it becomes, uh, it's a doubt if it works or not. Let's say he says, your betrothed to me, that I have, right, if I have 200 zoots. So if he can bring uh, witnesses to prove that he has 200 zoots, so then it's valid. Um, let's say he says that I'm going to show you 200 zoots, so then, the Gemara interprets this as saying, when I show it to you, it means that it's his. It has to be his own money. He can't just like point to something in a window. And if he is a money changer, so then it's invalid because that money isn't his. It's the money from his business. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, Next Mishnah, uh, we have more cases of Kiddushin with a stipulation. Let's say he says, here's your betrothal on condition that I have a, um, a, a certain amount of land, a bait core, which is quite a large p amount of land. So it's valid if he has it. Let's say he says, um, if I have this amount of land in this particular place. So if it's in that place, it's valid. If it's not in the place, it's not valid. If I show you a baked core, it's valid. Um, again, valid if he shows it to her. So now the Gemara says that he has to bring witnesses to prove that he owns this land. Um, right? And the, the Gemara says we need the case of the money and we need the case of the land right it seems very parallel so the Gemara says no we need both cases because money you can hide but land you can't hide so either way he has to show that he has either the money or the land um as we said if you state a specific place it needs to be in that place and again as we said if i say i'm going to show it to you again it has to be that it's his. You can't just walk by and point to some land. It needs to be his. Um, Doc 61 tells us how do we measure the land, right? We said a bait core. Um, so how do we measure that? A core is an amount of um, seed that you can plant uh, in a certain area. So how do we measure this land? So the Gemara asks, what if there are large stones on the field or like clefts in the field? Do they count or not? Um, so the Gemara says that, let's say if you sanctify a field, so then, um, so then uh, if those things are larger than 10 tfachim, if you remember 10 hand breaths, that makes a, a, its own domain um, and therefore it's not sanctified. Um, but in a field, maybe it doesn't matter because maybe it could be plowed anyway or you could use that area. Um, so um, the Gemara tells us that if you sell a field, so then, right, if let's say I say, I'm going to sell you five acres of land, if there's like a huge ditch or a large rock in that area, it's not part of the measurement and you have to add more land because, again, you're buying a field to um, plant 
different things, you need to be able to plant in the on the land. Otherwise, you can't. Um, so the Gemara says that kiddushin is like hektesh, like sanctifying the land, and therefore, as long as it doesn't have Let's say these ditches don't have water in it, so then it is counted in the measurement. Okay, next Mishnah. Um, any condition, any stipulation um, needs to be worded like it's worded in the Torah. Where do we have in the Torah a condition? Uh, so the, the Mishnah tells us with the tribes of God and Reuven, if you remember in Sefer Dvarim, um, they, um, in Sefer Bamidbar, sorry, in Sefer Bamidbar, um, they uh, say that they want to stay on the other side of the Jordan River because the land is very good, uh, it's very fertile, it's good for their crop, their, uh, their crop, their, um, their cattle, their goats and sheep. Um, and therefore, they want to stay. Um, so the, the Mishnah says, anytime you give a stipulation, it has to be the way they stipulated. So the Mishnah explains um, that what's their stipulation? If we do X, uh, right? So then um, w this will happen. And if we don't, then Y, right? Um, it, it has to be in the positive. And in the negative, um, it has to be a double condition. In Hebrew, this is called a tnai kaful, double. Um, it needs to be double. You cannot infer one side, right, the negative from the positive or vice versa. Um, another opinion in the Mishnah is no, you can infer one from the other, and um, you don't need the double tonight, the double condition. So that is the machloket in the Mishnah. So now the Gemara tells us that, as we said, the Torah teaches that you need this double um, condition, right? So just like a person who splits up his property and he says, you get this and you get that. Um, and if you don't take the money, you can have this, meaning, and if not, then this, right? You have to give all the um, all the permutations. Um, so then the Gemara says, maybe if Moshe didn't repeat himself, maybe the tribes wouldn't get any portion, right? Or right at all, or maybe they would get an equal portions to their brother. So the Gemara says, maybe that's not the reason. Um, so uh, here the Gemara talks about the two sacrifices of Cain and Havel, um, right, which we just read, uh, right? The two sacrifices of Cain the Hevel. God says to Cain, right, to Cain, if you improve, then na na na. And if you don't, na na na, right? So we see even God, when he speaks, he speaks in the positive and in the negative. Um, so Gemara says, no, maybe that's not a proof. Maybe you might have thought that if he doesn't do good, maybe he won't get punished, but Right. Therefore, the, the 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 verse needs to say he will get punished. Um, another time we see this double condition is with Abraham when he sends his servant Eliezer to get a wife for his son for Yitzchak. He says, "If you bring her back, then na na na, and if not, then you're free from my oath." Again, it shows that it's a double uh, a double uh, stipulation. Or maybe, no, you might have thought that um, he actually has to bring her against his will, against her will, uh, and she can't, uh, he can't, he's not released from the oath. And the last one is um, in Bechu Kotai, right? If God says, right, if you follow in my commandments, then X, and if not, then Y. Um, the Gemara continues. And talks about Sota, right? And here's a good uh, review. If you remember, she has to take an oath and she says, right, if you didn't sleep with someone, na 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 na. Uh, but interestingly enough, with Sota, it does not give us a double condition, right? But if you did, na na na. Um, or maybe the verse does allude 
to the positive, and it is actually a double stipulation. Um, okay, the next Mishnah on Daf 62 tells us that if he, let's say a person patrols a woman, and he says, I thought she was uh, from the line of the priest. I thought she was a Kohenet, but really she's a Levi, or I thought she was rich or I thought she was poor, or, right, he thought one thing, but really she's another. So the Mishnah tells us she is still betrothed because she didn't le mislead him directly, right? This is not a case where she said, I am a Kohenet, um, and he says, okay, fine, I'll betroth you, and she says, oh, just kidding. That's not the case. Um, the case here is that, um, that he assumed, right? She did not say anything directly, uh, and therefore she is still betrothed. Let's say he says to her, I want you to be betrothed to me after I convert, right? Meaning he wasn't Jewish, or after you convert, meaning she wasn't Jewish, or after my master frees me, right? He's a slave, or after my your master frees you, or, uh, this is a good one, um, he says, I would love to betroth you when your husband dies, uh, but he is still alive, um, right? Or after you do chalitza with your yavam, right? She's waiting to do yibum. All of those are invalid, right? Th that does not work. Um, the governor is going to go through each case and tell us why. Um, let's say a, a man says, um, if your wife gives birth to a girl, then she will be betrothed to me, right? He wants to be betrothed to the fetus. Um, so this is not valid. Sounds reasonable. Um, or another, uh, another opinion in the Mishnah is that if you can tell that she's pregnant uh, and she has a girl, then she is betrothed. Um, it is valid. So now the Gemara explains these cases. Um, and the way the Gemara understands it is if it's in your ability to make the change, so then the condition is valid. But, uh, right, because you can do it, right? If I give you 200 shekel, if I have this land, right? It's about if I have the money. So uh, because I have that um, ability to uh, affect this condition, so then it works. But if it is not what's called biado in your hand, in your ability to do it, so then, uh, then it is not valid, right? When your husband dies, that is not in your ability um, because we assume you will not take matters into your own hands, um, and therefore it is not in your ability. Um, so the Gemara says that everything in the Mishnah isn't in the person's control, um, even conversion, right? You'd think, wait, conversion is in the person's control. But again, as we know, conversion needs to be done in front of a, a court, and maybe the person will fail the test. So it's not necessarily in your complete control. Um, okay, um, let's say, um, okay, so let's go to the, the betrothal of the fetus. Right? It has to be recognizable that she's pregnant, um, and therefore, um, and therefore, it would be valid. Um, there are three sages that agree that you can convey something that hasn't come into the world yet. Right? This is a big machloket in in the Talmud. Can I um, buy, acquire, affect something that doesn't exist yet? Right, this is called makne davar shelo ba shelo ba baolam. Right, it does not shelo ba leolam. It doesn't exist yet. Right, can I sanctify apples if they haven't grown yet on my apple tree? Um, right, so that's what we're discussing. He is betrothing a fetus that does not yet that hasn't been born yet. All right, again, it's interesting. Do we see it? Um, do we see it as um, something that exists yet or not? Um, again, you're right. The, we're not talking about controlling. Zora's asking about controlling the gender of the fetus. That's not in the control. Um, but uh, the question is, here it's not about control. Here it's about does, does the child exist yet? 
Uh, so that's why the Gemara says, if you see that she's pregnant, so then the, the fetus exists uh, and therefore it would be okay. Um, right, so it comes, the Gemara compares it to um, truma, again, the, the gift that we give to the Kohen. Can I give truma from something that hasn't grown yet? Um, and some say it depends on what stage it is of its growth. If it's grown a little bit, so then I can say when it's fully grown, then I'm going to separate this this area for truma. Um, so, um, as we said, right, the truma, it's talking about if it's fully grown. Um, right again, Rebbe talks about um, when you say um, we have this case, actually, uh, we're now on Doc 63. Um, the case is where a person says, when I buy you as a slave, you're automatically going to go free. Now, how could I how could I free the slave if I don't own him yet? Um, so, um, according to Rebbe, this is valid. I could say, when I buy you, I'm going to set you free. Um, and as we said, Rebbe Mayer says that a person can say. Right, I will be betrothed to you after I convert or after you convert. Um, he says that really it does work, but it's a machloket if it works because it encourages hatred, right? If I say, um, you know, I'll accept betrothal even though I'm married to somebody else, like that doesn't, that seems uh, very complicated. Um, another, um, another case is, um, when Rabbi Kiva says that a woman can forbid her husband from the things that she earns. Now, she didn't earn them yet. How could she forbid her husband from taking those things? Um, so, of course, we've learned this before, that basically, what is she saying? She's not sanctifying the things that she's earning. Rather, she's sanctifying her hands. Anything that her hands create um, those become sanctified or those become forbidden to her husband. Okay, next Mishnah on Daf 63. Um, a man says, you are betrothed to me on condition that I, I will go talk to the ruler about you um, or that I can work for you for the day. Um, like these are all like services that he's going to do for her. And the question is, um, is the payment, remember we said, Kiddushin comes with money. Um, so um, the, the question is, um, is the service that he's doing for her, is that seen as the value of that is the betrothal money or is he just, is it bonus? Um, so that that is one question. Um, the next, so now the Gemara explains, it's only valid if he gives her a pruta as well. Meaning the Gemara says, no, he has to give her money to betroth her. Remember, betrothal is with money. So he gives her a pruta, could be the smallest denomination of money. Um, but, uh, and then he can do that favor for her or not, but it's not the value of that service, right? The the service, right, the Gemara says, but maybe the service could be the value. So we say, no, he has to give her the pruta also. It's not enough to just do the service. If he says, be betrothed to me in return for my service, so now it's valid because it's the schar, it's the, um, the value of that uh, of that service um, that is going to be her betrothal money. Um, okay, next Mishnah. Um, be betrothed to me if my father approves. Um, so if the father approves, it's valid. Let's say the father died before he could say anything. We say that it is valid um, because we assume that he'd say yes. Um, if the son dies, we tell the father to say that he disapproves so that it's as if they were never betrothed. And then the wife does not have to do yibum with the brother. So the Gemara says, even if the father is silent, we see it as approval. This is a very famous line in the Talmud. 
uh, in Hebrew, the line, the uh, concept is shtika kehodaya, right? Kehodaa. Um, shtika, silence, is uh, is approval, right? So if I say, um, you know, can I come to you for a meal and you don't say anything, according to the law, it's as if you're agreeing, uh, right? Let's go. Okay, you didn't say anything, so I'm assuming I'm coming to your house. Um, Okay, right, but if the father protests, then it disqualifies the betrothal, right? Or the Mishnah means if my father doesn't protest in the next 30 days, right? Maybe, uh, maybe it is, um, maybe it is limited and then he can only, um, disqualify it within a certain amount of time, but not more than that. Okay, next Mishnah. The father says he um, betrothed his daughter, but he doesn't remember uh, which daughter he betrothed. Um, so if, uh, ah, sorry, he doesn't remember to whom he betrothed his daughter. Um, so if a man comes and says, oh, no, right, I'm your future father, and I'm your future son-in-law. So then we believe that man. Um, but if two men come, so then we're not sure and the woman needs a get from both of them, or she can marry one of them and get a get from the other one. So now the Gemara explains, right? The father is believed to, um, to accept a divorce, um, but not, uh, wait, sorry, one second. Um, sorry, the man is believed um, to divorce her, but not enough to marry her. Or, right, again, remember the first case was, he doesn't remember, somebody comes and um, somebody comes and then he says um, that, um, uh, sorry, somebody comes and says, oh, it was me. So now the Gemara interprets, what does that mean that he's believed? Is he believed enough that he can marry her? Or maybe he's only believed um, to divorce her, but not to marry her, right? Those are the two, um, those are the two options of how we understand that Mishnah. Um, let's say a woman accepted Kiddushin for herself, right? The Mishnah gave a case of the father accepting. Let's say she accepts it, um, but she doesn't remember to who. And then um, the man says, it was him. We do not believe him because maybe she would say, oh, yeah, 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 right? Only to like cover it up, um, but she doesn't really um, remember. And then if it's the two men, again, they're believed um, because, again, they're scared of the father. They're scared that the father will remember um, who he betrothed his daughter to. Let's say she married the man, and then another man comes and says, no, 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 I was the one that your father uh, betrothed you to. So we do not believe the second man because we don't want him to be able to prohibit her, right, the daughter, from the husband that she already is married to. Um, as we said, the father has the power to say he betrothed his daughter. It's a machloket if he has the power to also um, uh, accuse her or kind of get her in trouble uh, so much so that she could um, that she could um, get killed, right? Because again, if let's say he says she was betrothed and then it turns out that um, that um, she, let's say, had an affair. So now we say, no, we don't, we don't believe him that much. Um, a father can, um, can um, testify that his child is 12 or 13 uh, for bringing a, let's say, a sacrifice, but not to get the child punished, right? Again, we believe testimony only up to a point, but we do not, um, believe that um, we do not believe the testimony to the point that we would get the person uh, punished or killed based on that testimony. Okay, Daf 64. Um, Daf 64, the Mishnah tells us um, um, that a father says, I accepted betrothal and divorce for my 
daughter who is under 12, he was very busy. Um, and if she's still under 12 at the time of his testimony, so then the father is believed. If she is already an adult, meaning over 12, he is not believed. Um, let's say he says, um, my daughter was captured and I redeemed her. He is not believed. Again, we assume that when there is capture, um, there's also um, a violation of the girl. And if that's the case, she would no longer be able to marry a Kohen, a priest. And therefore, in this case, we do not believe the father in order to make her uh, to make her invalid to marry a Kohen. So now the Gemara explains, um, because the father can marry his daughter off to someone um, who is invalid to her, um, therefore he's believed. We say, no, it doesn't, um, that does not invalidate her. Let's say if he would marry her off to a Kohen who is a halal um, or a mamzer, someone who is illegitimate. Um, we say that the father is believed in the first case um, of the, when the daughter is still a minor, because again, it's in his power to do this. She is still a minor. So remember, it's biado. He has the ability to do this. But the other cases in the Mishnah, those are not in his control. And therefore, because it's not in his power to do it, he is not believed um, to testify about those cases. Um, okay, next Mishnah. A person, we have a lot of Mishnah to this, uh, this class. Um, a person is believed on their deathbed to say that he has a son, right? Because again, if he has a son, then the wife does not have to do yibum, but um, he is not believed that, to say that he has brothers, which will make her have to do yibum. Remember, again, we want to limit and not give her, like, bind her too much. So if he's getting her out of doing yibum, we believe him. If it's making her do yibum, we do not believe him. So now the Gemara says, um, he is, again, believed to permit her to other people, but not to prohibit her from other people. Um, that's according to Rebbe. Rebbe Natan says that he is even permitted to prohibit her, um, and only at the deathbed he retracts what he told her at when he betrothed her, um, and therefore we believe him, because why would he lie? Um, so the, the Gemara explains um, the concept of chazaka. If you remember, the concept of chazaka is where there is a, 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 an idea, an assumption that we were under uh, from the beginning, and uh, that is binding. Uh, and in order to change a chazaka, something has to uproot it, right? Something has to uproot what we already assumed. So the chazaka is that the husband doesn't have sons or brothers. Let's say he told her that, or he implied that when they got married. If the statement comes, um, continues what we assumed, meaning she got married, he says, you know, I have no brothers. So she's like, great, I'll never have to do yibum. So if he comes at the, uh, on his deathbed and he says, I actually have a son. Right, that continues the chazaka. She still doesn't have to do yibo, so we believe him. Right, but if he comes to negate what the chazaka, right, if he says, "Oh, actually, I do have a brother," so then um, that is then he is not believed. Um, again, we have this idea of he's believed because we could say, "Why would he lie?" Right, what's the point of his lying? Um, and that seems to be very strong, almost like witnesses, and those can uproot a chazaka, right, an assumption that we had from before, um, or no, we do not believe him. Um, okay, next Mishnah, a man accepted Kiddushin for his daughter, but doesn't remember which daughter. Um, so, um, if let's say he has older daughters and younger daughters, here we're talking about adult versus minor, right? Above 12 
or under 12. So um, the adult girls are not included in this idea because we assume that he's not going to accept betrothal for the older daughters where he doesn't get the money uh, when there are younger daughters in the home. Okay, now we have, we actually had this case before, but this is the source. Um, there are two groups of daughters, um, right? So an older group, right? Let's say a man had two wives. He has uh, the first wife, he had a whole set of children. Then he gets divorced or he has marries a new woman and he has another whole set of children. So let's say he says, I accepted Kiddushim for my oldest daughter. So now how do you understand my oldest daughter? Um, right, we don't know which group, right? Maybe it means the oldest of the oldest, maybe it's the oldest of the youngest. Um, and therefore the Mishnah says, all of the girls are prohibited from this man, except for the youngest of the youngest, because there's no way that his last child is ever gonna be called the oldest. Um, or all of them are permitted to marry whoever they want, except for the oldest of the oldest, because you know maybe you only have one eldest child. Um, now the Mishnah gives us the flip case, which is he says, I betrothed my youngest. Does it mean the youngest of the youngest? Does it mean the youngest of the oldest? And, and we have the same opinions, meaning either all of them are forbidden except for the oldest because you would never call the oldest girl the youngest, or all of them are permitted except for the youngest of the youngest because she's called the youngest. Um, so now the Gemara is going to talk this all out. Um, again, the first case is he accepted betrothal. Uh, he has you know, some adults and some children in his house, younger uh, girls in his house. All the younger girls, meaning under 12, are, are included in this. We don't know who he accepted betrothal for or no. The case is only if there's one old, one adult child and one, uh, one adult daughter and one minor daughter. So then that minor daughter is, um, is Mikudesha. She's betrothed. Um, even if the older daughter made her made him her agent, right? She says, "Go find me a husband." We assume that he's going to take um, kiddushin for the younger one before the older one, because if she's an adult, he doesn't get the money. If if she's a minor, so then he does get the money. Um, okay, the Gemara asks, "Why do we need both cases of the oldest and the youngest when we were talking about the two groups?" So um, the Gemara says, well, it's always nice to call someone older or oldest, right? So each one is called older if she has a younger sibling, right? You're such a big boy, right? Because you have a younger sibling. Um, but, right, but maybe that's not the case with the youngest, right? No one wants to be called the youngest. Um, so maybe, um, you know, you would still call the youngest the youngest or, right, again, Maybe the argument here is, do people um, put themselves in a situation of doubt, right? Meaning, if I say the oldest, could it mean anybody? Or do I mean the oldest? Because I said the oldest and the same thing with the youngest. Um, okay. Um, all right. Next, Mishnah on Daf 65. Um, a man says that he betrothed a woman and she says no you didn't right he said she said um so he said yes and she said no so if he says he did so now he can't marry her relatives right because it's as if they were betrothed but she can marry his relatives because she denies the claim uh so this is just fascinating because we believe them and we don't believe them, right? We believe each one for their own unique situation, even though that situation is the same situation. Um, so that's just very interesting how the Mishnah separates the two testimonies. Um, let's say she says she was betrothed and he says, no, she can't marry his relatives and he can, 
right? He says he betrothed her and she says, no, 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 you betrothed my daughter, not me. So then he is forbidden to the mother's relatives because that's who he said he betrothed. The mother is permitted to marry his relatives because she denied it. And then he is permitted to the daughter's relatives because he had nothing to do with her. Um, but the and the daughter is also permitted to marry all of his relatives. Uh, let's just take a step back for one minute. If you remember, this is, takes us all the way back to Yevamot when we learned about forbidden relationships. Um, and we talked about um, that, right? If a man marries a woman, he cannot marry her relatives, right? Her mother, her daughter, her sister, right? Her relatives become prohibited to him um, and vice versa, right? She cannot marry his father, um, right? She cannot marry his son. Um, so um, those relatives are forbidden to the spouse um, if they are married or even if they were betrothed. But here we have a he said, she said situation where uh, each one makes a claim. So we believe them in so much as to say, um, right, if you're making yourself prohibited, so then you're prohibited. If you're making yourself permitted, so then you're permitted. Um, the last case in the Mishnah is he says he betrothed her daughter and she says, no, you betrothed me. So now it's the flip case, right? So he is forbidden to the daughter's relatives. The daughter is permitted to his relatives because the daughter hasn't been involved at all. Nobody asked her anything. Um, he is permitted to the mother's relatives because his claim was to the daughter, not to the mother. And the mother is forbidden to his relatives because, again, she admits, she says that you betrothed me. So we listen. We listen to everybody. Okay. So now the Gemara says um, that the Mishnah teaches that a person can prohibit himself from things or people, but you cannot prohibit other people from doing things. Um, and we need all four of these cases, right? It doesn't matter if it was the man who made the claim or the woman. Um, and the Mishnah also teaches that the mother isn't believed to say that the daughter was betrothed and therefore prohibited to marry his relatives, meaning a father would have been believed because in that sense, it's biblical. It was the Oraita that he betrothed the daughter, but here it's rabbinic that the mother has that power and therefore she's not believed in order to prohibit the daughter. Um, now we have a machloket if we force the man to give her a get, to give her a get, or we ask him, you know, we ask him nicely. Um, or maybe it's not a machloket, we ask him, and if he says no, so then we force him. Or um, if he gives it after he was asked, then we force him to pay her the ketuva. Um, so those are different interpretations of forcing. Um, okay, kiddushin in front of one witness isn't valid, right? Even if the man and the woman admit to it. If you remember in the beginning of the Masechah, we talked about witnesses that need to see the betrothal process. And if they don't see it, it is not valid. Um, so our mission implies that it's in front of one witness. And the Gemara says, no, our Mishnah is that there were actually two witnesses originally, but now they're overseas and we can't prove anything. So we, we believe we believe both of them up into a up into a certain point. Um, okay, let's say, speaking of believing, um, two men and one woman and a package come into a city from overseas. It sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it's not a joke. Um, so each man says, um, this is my wife and this is my slave and that package is mine. Right, the the I own that. Right, and the other one says the opposite. And the woman says, "These men are my slaves, and 
that package is mine, right? So now, who do you believe? We have three people. They're all coming together. I don't know who's who. So the Gemara says that she needs to get a get from both of the men, and then she takes the package as her ktuba money. But it has to be that there is at least one witness for each claim, or she doesn't need two gets. She doesn't need two divorces because of if there's one witness. Um, so then, um, if she wants, um, ah, she only needs the witness if she wants to take the package for herself. Um, then, uh, then she would need uh, to do the. Then she would need the uh, to, a get in order to take the package as her tuva. Um, so now, in monetary matters, if the litigant admits, so then it's like a hundred witnesses. Um, but in matters of what we call erva, which is uh, relations between a man and a woman, so then. Uh, again, marriage, divorce, things like that, um, because it affects other people. So then um, it's not enough for you to admit it. Rather, you actually need witnesses. Um, witnesses are only there to, um, they're only there for evidence in financial transactions. But it's different when we're talking about marriage and divorce. Um, let's say, so now the Gemara brings cases where one witness is enough in other cases, um, right? Like if um, you ate forbidden fats, uh, this forbidden food. Um, so again, if a person doesn't know what to do and then a person says, um, you know, I didn't do it, uh, again, uh, is the person believed or not? Um, so one witness also works for saying that your food became impure um, or that your ox was sodomized. There are different cases here um, that talk about one witness. Um, there's a story now on Zaf 66. Um, there's a story of um, one witness who said, um, right, um, that they said basically, if you trust him like two witnesses, so then it's valid. But in general, it's not okay. Um, so that shows that in general, we need two witnesses. Uh, and from here, there's a story about Yanai the king who put on, he was a king, uh, and he put on the seat, the headband um, of the high priest. Uh, basically, he became a high priest as well. Um, and the sages were very upset with him. Um, and they said that even though his father was a priest, um, his mother was actually taken captive, and therefore he is not a valid priest, and he should not be making himself a priest. Uh, it turns out that this was not true. His mother was fine. Um, and then a person says, oh, look at those sages. They're trying to destroy you, um, and therefore you should kill all of the sages. Um, and he basically, um, he basically killed all the sages, uh, except for Shimon ben Shetach, who was his um, his brother-in-law, um, and he basically uh, saved him. Um, it, my friend Shuli Mishkin wrote a very a beautiful article about this on Hadran, so you can look at that, uh, talking about uh, the King Yanai he's from the time of the Maccabim, of the Maccabees, uh, and some of the history behind that. Um, so uh, you can uh, check that out on the uh, Hadron website. Um, but here again, the Gemara says maybe this is a case where it was one witness as opposed to two witnesses, or maybe it was two against two, um, and maybe that was the case. Um, okay, um, let's say uh, you have, um, let's say uh, again, you have one witness who comes and says that a priest. Uh, has a blemish, and then the person says, no, that's not true, so then we don't believe the witness. But if the person is quiet and doesn't say anything, so then we do believe him. Or we tell the Kohen, prove to us that you don't have a moon, right? Let's see. Um, if the priest is discovered 
um, to be uh, an invalid priest, meaning he's the son of a divorcee or of a woman who did chalitza. And let's say he, they make this claim as he's doing the work in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple. So the service that he did is valid. Uh, and this is learned from different sources um, in the Gemara. Uh, and the last thing that we're going to do for today um, is, again, talking about the Kohen. We said if he has a uh, an issue with his lineage, his work, what he does, the service is valid. But if he has a blemish, the service is not valid. Um, and it must be um, he must be whole, shalem, um, and therefore um, any any service that he does, um, he must he must do it um, when he's whole um, and not blemished. Uh, with this, we are going to stop, um, and we'll pick up next week uh, with the Mishnah on the bottom of Daf sixty six. Uh, and again, as I said, I wish everyone. Um, you know, just good news, as they say in Hebrew, besorot tovot, um, and uh, really just uh, comfort uh, in these very challenging times. Um,